Welcome to our lab. And uh, this is, I don't know how many days, like about a week after we finish the competition. We're just gonna be cleaning up soon. So before we do that, I would like to uh, show you guys some of our uh, best setups that we have built. So this is for fuses. So uh, I'll just follow how the power flows through this, okay? So we have a just an extension cord, like a power bar. And then we have the power going into our variac. Uh, this is a, just a variable transformer. And then this variac actually goes into our oil-cooled high current transformer. So as you can see on one side of it, uh, the primary, we have many, many turns, and then the secondary only has a few turns. So if you know anything about transformers, you will know that um, actually this will allow us to drop the voltage, and uh, for the same voltage and current, uh, we're gonna have a high current on the secondary side. And uh, then uh, the secondary flows into uh, this big array of things. So what we have is we have uh, three full bridge rectifiers. Each can handle 150 amps, although uh, at the end the system can't actually deliver 150 amps. But um, anyway, so we have AC on the red lines going in, and then we have DC coming out from the other end. So here we have some, uh, I believe it's uh, six gauge cables. And on this side we have a, some, a, uh, I think this is one gauge cable. And then here we also have this massive capacitor here, which is like five farads. It is a gigantic like super capacitor. It is used for like car audio and stuff like that. It's five farads and it can handle about like 24 volts. So uh, this is below uh, the peak voltage of our system. So our system can handle it safely. And then uh, the current, the DC current, then we'll go through this shunt, which we made and calibrated ourselves. And then here we have these two gigantic um, welding clamps, which will hold uh, our fuse right here. So then on the measurement side, uh, we want to be able to determine the amount of current that flows through our, our system. So what we have here is that uh, the shunt on two sides of it has uh, the differential probe connected to it. And this differential probe is, is essentially, if there's some like op amps and stuff inside, uh, and it essentially allows us to uh, probe any parts in our circuit without having to worry too much about where the ground is. The signal for this then goes into our sort of homemade amplifier here. Uh, I believe this is um, just one op amp, very simple circuit. And then to power this op amp, we have this also homemade power supply. This is a, a bipolar power supply. It has both positive and negative 15 volts. And then the signal out of this amplifier goes into our oscilloscope, uh, which you see it's, it's, it's a pretty cheap oscilloscope, but uh, whatever. So here we have it in sort of a scanning mode. It's not being triggered or anything by any signals. And then uh, once we actually turn the system on, you will see that uh, there's gonna be a dip right here, uh, which will uh, indicate that current is flowing. And then depending on uh, how long that dip is, we can figure out uh, how long it takes for the fuse to blow. And then uh, you know, how high that dip is will tell us exactly how much current is flowing. Uh, we have some like, amplification factors along the way, but it uh, should all be proportional and good and stuff. Okay, so let's set one up. Let me just go find a piece of wire. I'm supposed to, I think, just, just like, First, I need to disconnect this. And turn it to the variac somehow, right? Maybe to like, I don't know, 40 volts or something. Sure. Turn it on. Hopefully, no smoke flies out. I'll turn on our meter. And I will show how many volt AC it's got. So these, this meter essentially just probes between these two points. I'm not going to touch it because it might zap me. Although it's only one volt, it shouldn't hurt me. But I'm going to crank it up to about two volts. Perhaps two volts, okay. And then I'm gonna turn the variac off. Uh, we also have a discharge capacitor, uh, a resistor there to just discharge the capacitor so we don't get zapped. And then we'll just clamp this on. Okay. Let's give this thing a quick wipe. Make sure it's nice and clean. Okay, and then if I just turn this on, it should start to smoke and you should be able to see something there, hopefully. Crank it up to like 90. 
shall tap. I can watch the screen as well after the scanning is over, we'll get started. Okay, hear it? Smokes? Nice. As you can see here, it's the stock pit. You see there's a nice little curve here. Some noise because our capacitor, although it's 5 Farads, it might still not have high enough capacitance to keep uh, it perfectly ripple-free, to keep the DC perfectly ripple-free. But as you can see here, if we just use these cursors, we can accurately determine um, how long the fuse actually runs. And then through you know, doing some averaging and stuff like that, we can determine uh, how much DC current passes through. So this is our guitar string setup. So I'll follow where the signal goes again. So here we have a phone or a computer that will uh, just output a sine wave as an audio signal. Then that goes into this mixer board, which it has like a microphone preamp, and then it has uh, some other amplification. Uh, and then this gets outputted through uh, to this uh, audio amplifier, and this audio amplifier then drives uh, this electromagnet. It's essentially driving the electromagnet as a speaker, right? And then on the way, we have uh, just two um, one ohm resistors in parallel, and this will act as our current shunt. This will allow us to measure the sinusoidal current. Unfortunately, I don't have the oscilloscope here to show you the current, but um, we have some pictures of that we can put up. And then here on the mechanical side, we just have a piece of wood as our base. And then here we have this, um, this part where the string can sort of hang down and then we have some weights hanging off the bottom. Now you can see the string is vibrating because we are passing in a signal that is 14 hertz and that sort of matches the resonance frequency of the string. Okay, it looks kind of trippy on camera, but okay. On this side, we have um, two translation stages. We have one that is like digital, and then one that's like very traditional analog with the micrometer sort of style. Okay, I sort of cheaped out on this. And then we 3D printed uh, this piece that goes on top, and then it has a little bit of a, uh, there's, a little, there's a little stand here. And then it has this little hole that will fit actually a Hall effect sensor. So uh, now we can turn off the lights and then we can see the laser setup. Turn off this light. So we have a uh, laser diode and then it has some sort of uh, optics, probably just some like cylindrical shaped lens elements or something like that in the front. And then that, it actually spreads the light into a, like a line. So it's actually a sort of a line laser, and you can see that this laser is held by this light stand and then it shines onto our string, and you can see as it vibrates, right, we can see that um, the laser light shines on it, onto it, and then uh, we can just film it, and then we can get some idea about the amplitude of the string. So yeah, that's our guitar string setup. This corner is the uh, sort of hardcore mechanics problems corner. Okay, this is the corner where we have uh, blast proof things. Not a dirty, but okay. So if you look around, you see that uh, we have uh, these panels here that are all somehow stuck to this. And then if anything decides to fly out, it wouldn't hurt, you know, the rest of the lab. And then we also have this piece right here. This piece is great. It's a movable barrier with the wheel not really working very well anymore, but still it could uh, protect us in case things decide to fly out. And this is also the corner where we have these heavy machine tools. Uh, yeah, tools are a mess, but uh, result is hopefully good. So, um, Let's take a look at our beat dynamics setup. So for our beat dynamics setup, it's essentially the most hardcore machine that we've built. Okay. Um, let me talk about the electronics first. So um, this whole thing is powered by this DC motor right here. And then the DC motor 
actually uh, connects uh, to this whole thing by a timing belt. Okay, like uh, during the competition, like people asked us whether the belt will slip. And then uh, somehow our team members did not remember that this is a timing belt. But anyway, uh, there's the pulley for it. Uh, as you can see, it's all like geared, it's a timing belt. And then underneath here, we actually have this piece that will rotate around with the pulley. And then uh, this uh, actually is essentially an optical chopper of sorts. It will block off the light from uh, these two uh, IR, emitter, and uh, receiver pairs. And then depending on how fast this whole apparatus spins, uh, it chops up the light, and then that will allow us to determine its angular velocity. And then controlling circuit-wise, um, to power the motor, we actually need two power supplies because the current requirement is just too high. Uh, one power supply will not do. And in order to make these power supplies sort of like track each other, uh, we have you know, a whole array of uh, diodes here. Looks kind of sketchy, but still, it's functional, right? Tape, right? Uh, so we have an array of diodes so that uh, the power supplies wouldn't like self-destruct. And then in terms of the signal-wise, we have, everything is powered by this Arduino Mega, right? And this Arduino Mega sends out PWM signals to these two motor controllers. They have a particular part number, which I can't remember. L298 or something like yeah, that. Yeah. And then uh, these two then will send uh, the current all the way through the diodes and then uh, through into uh, our motor. And then on the mechanical side, we have this uh, steel frame that is built using this sort of like perforated uh, square tubing. We have some angle brackets and everything to secure it. And then what's really neat about this is that we have these two uh, sort of bearing enclosures. These are just this cast iron piece with a ball bearing in the middle. We made our shaft essentially by using this uh, piece of, uh, I believe it is 5 8 inch threaded rod. And then we just like uh, use the lathe and then we, we uh, reduce the diameter of it so that it fits into these bearings. Our main uh, hoop is a 3D printed part. So we have actually three parts put into one. So we have a bottom piece and then two top pieces, and they're bolted together here. And then uh, this part, we just sort of like sanded it flat so that this uh, ball can roll uh, on our hoop. And then uh, this whole thing is supported by these two aluminum square tubings, and then uh, they have these threaded rods on the sides for structural support. And if we want to change the hoop size, we simply just take the plastic hoop off, maybe adjust the height of these two aluminum pieces by changing the location of these nuts on the threaded rod, and then we could uh, just mount in a new hoop. You can see uh, here we have a bunch of holes for different size hoops. And then uh, to change the offset uh, of this hoop, uh, you see here we have a gigantic slot here. We essentially just loosen these two nuts, and then also the nuts underneath, and then we can just slide the thing left and right. And then for, you know, just filming and getting data, we have this um, other piece, which is built out of also square aluminum tubing. And then on here, we have some LED panels to, you know, uniformly illuminate this scene. We have a black background here, obviously. And then here on this piece right here, which is kind of out of service at the moment, uh, this uh, mount here, we can actually put a GoPro here and then it would, uh, film the bead in a rotating reference frame. So it will allow us to track the location of it. And especially when we did uh, the tilting of the thing, so we could just tilt the whole setup, we observed resonance in this bead, and then uh, the rotating reference frame really helps us capture the entire motion. Right. So uh, that's pretty much it for this setup. Oh, also the back, it has uh, the same sort of structure and some counterweight just uh, hidden under these duct tape. So uh, yeah, so this thing spins very nicely and we will put up some footage of it spinning. And yeah, that's our beat dynamics. So this is our irreversible Cartesian diver setup. And this setup is pretty interesting too. We have this long clear tube and then we have uh, these two caps that we have uh, 3D printed. They're specially designed so that uh, they can fit these O-rings here and they wouldn't leak. 
and then we just compress these two caps together using uh, these 3 8 inch uh, threaded rods. And if we put our diver in here, we can see it obviously, and we can optically track it. And uh, this whole apparatus is quite interesting. So here we have a few things. This out for now. So we have this quick connect, right, that will connect to the top of this cap. And then we have a safety valve, right? Safety is also you know, really important. This, will, this is an adjustable one. So you can actually change what pressure it blows. Then through this coupler, it connects to our pressure transducer. This will measure the pressure inside the tube, so the air above the water. And also here we have a um, barbed connector, which connects to this clear soft tubing to this valve. This, on the other side of the valve, there's also a quick connect. And this fits onto our air compressor, which is there. The air, air compressor is kind of old, it's sort of leaky, but whatever. Uh, the rest of the setup is pretty good. And then we just put this on and we use the electronics. So we have actually a 16-bit analog to digital converter, the ADS1115. So this chip actually takes uh, the input uh, from our pressure transducer and it will read it. And then, then it passes a signal into this Makov uh, Arduino Uno. We have a proper Arduino Mega, but for some reason it didn't work. It might have been fried, I don't know. But yeah, so this Arduino will actually read the pressure in here and then uh, we can add pressure by just uh, switching on that valve and then uh, pressure, uh, the air compressor tank will then feed air into it and then that will cause our diver to sink. So this is our hand helicopter sort of preliminary testing setup. So this is a vacuum chamber. The way you see we have a vacuum pump over there, a bit dirty, but still a vacuum pump. I have this, uh, Essentially, this pot like thing with this uh, very thick plexiglass lid that goes on top. Oh, oh, this thing blocks it, but it can be closed like this. Although a little dirty, but uh, it will seal in the air, right? And then we can just, uh, to pump it down, we just use a vacuum pump and then the pressure gauge will show us the pressure. And the reason why we want to put it in the uh, vacuum chamber is that we want to test the behavior of our blade for different uh, air densities. So this setup is also really interesting. We put a lot of time into this. So essentially, uh, we have a motor here, right, that will uh, spin the propeller, and this propeller is specially designed so that we can change the angle of attack. So I believe what you need to do is just that you just loosen these set screws, and then you can turn these uh, three blades into whatever angle you desire. And in here, uh, we essentially have a system that will keep the angular velocity of the blade at exactly uh, what we desire. So here we have a battery pack. It's a drill battery pack. It's like 18 volts. We just printed um, a block for it, and then that powers our whole system. And then this power goes into, I believe, that uh, buck converter. And that buck converter, what it essentially does is that it takes the 18 volts and then converts that uh, maybe down to like I don't know, like nine volts or something. Uh, that is a good uh, voltage for both uh, our uh, motor and our Arduino, so it wouldn't fry anything. And then the Arduino is, uh, again, the brain of the whole setup. It will send out a PWM signal uh, to control the speed of the motor through this motor controller. This is some generic motor controller that I don't know the part number of. And then um, also it uses the same technology as our beat dynamics. So it uses this uh, brake beam sensors here, right? IR emitter, receiver pair, and then it has this flag, has this flag here. So as this thing spins, right? The flag will just uh, act as sort of like an optical chopper and it will chop the IR beam to let us determine the angular velocity of the thing. And to measure lift, we have a weighing scale underneath weighing scale and then uh, and then this is in a sort of a multi-layer platform supported by these plexiglass pieces so that uh, the wind that actually is uh, blown down by these propeller blades will not actually go onto the scale itself so it will only be weighing you know the whole setup including the lift of it so that the air that pushes down onto it doesn't produce extra lift and then uh, what's really neat about the system is uh, actually the, the, the control system, so I'll show you. So we have this remote control, 
And that interfaces with that uh, IR uh, receiver right there. And uh, we can actually use this to control the speed of this motor while the chamber is on. And I'll show you that. Okay, so first we turn the switch on, lights will go up, and then this propeller will start spinning really fast. So that's just a power on self test sort of idea. We can close the chamber. You wouldn't be able to hear much anymore. But you see, there's a display over there that will show us the angular velocity. And if I just use my remote, right, if I just click these buttons, right, I can lower the set angular velocity gradually. I'll, I'll just lower it to some really low amount, let's say 100-ish. This is in what, like radians per mm -hmm. second? Yeah. And then you can see that displays the actual angular velocity and starting to drop and starting to match our set angular velocity. So that's all done in the Arduino code, of course. And you can also see the propeller begins to slow down. I'll just put it to some ultra low value. And it will eventually just slow down. Okay, this system might have some like resonance and might start to shake around at certain frequencies, but, but that's okay. So this will actually allow us to uh, get you know, angle of attack and then also angular velocity and then also air density as we pump down, right? And then how these factors affect the lift. The scale isn't turned on, but you can directly read the lift from the scale. So yeah, that's our preliminary setup for our uh, hand helicopter. So Dave right here, he is uh, gonna transport our cart, but since it's raining outside, we actually need to put the waterproof cover Maybe you want to reset on it. Recording. No, 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 it's fine. He's gonna get the cover right there. Yes. Right there, just gonna put it on. Uh, We're gonna ship it to another building. Do you have extra blades? Oh yeah, yeah. Sure. Remember the blades. Okay, we just have so many blades here. Oh, this here. one flies really well. Some yeah. printed blades, they're all printed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, um, how should we go? Okay, let's go. Stack it underneath, and then we'll We have go. too many thunderstorms. Yes, too many thunderstorms, exactly. Hi everyone, so this is our hand helicopter setup. Uh, and this is the setup that we're actually going to use to, to launch our blades. So uh, I guess it all starts with a power supply down here, which we use to control the, the, the voltage and the current, which controls the angular velocity of the entire system. That is connected directly to this DC motor down here, which is uh, very securely mounted to this uh, piece of wood. And then up here is like a mini platform we have with the same technology as the uh, uh, beat dynamics, the hand helicopter where we have a brake beam uh, emitter and a brake beam transceiver. And then uh, these pretty much just detect brakes in the IR signal as the shaft spins. And then to actually launch our blades, we had to be a bit creative with our design for it. So as you can see here, we 3D printed a, a mount. And this mount is essentially when the shaft spins to speed it up, it can take the blade along with it. And as soon as we apply like a sudden force to stop the shaft, the entire blade will just uh, unhook itself and fly up. So let's try it out. Slightly dangerous, but that's okay. We'll just back off. We're just turning up the voltage. You can see the blade is spinning. I did not even catch that. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. Three, two, one. Woo, nice. Some technologies that we developed for a sponge is also quite cool. We motorized the focus knob of a microscope. 
As we change the focus of the microscope, the slices go in and out of focus and only one slice is in focus. So this way, if we scan the focus from near to far, we could have a 3D construction of the structure of the sponge. They've developed some truly remarkable code and this is one of our reconstructions. These are all the setups that I want to show for today and I would like to thank all of my team members for working so hard on building these setups. And I'm sure next year we'll see more remarkable setups from my team. Make sure to like, share, and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.